Thank you very much, uh, Debbie. So uh, yesterday we heard from the newly appointed Mayor of the West Midlands, uh, Richard Parker, and with a looming general um, election, it's great to see that we've already got elected lots of cooperators in amongst our devolved powers. So we've got the likes of Ollie Coppard in South Yorkshire, Tracy Brabin in West Yorkshire, and in Greater Manchester where Corps UK is headquartered, we've got our very own um, Andy Burnham, who is usually a stalwart of uh, Congress, uh, but for all the reasons Johnny wasn't able uh, to make it to Congress and is uh, very similar. In fact, he's travelling today. You'll catch him on Laura Kustenberg tomorrow morning. Um, so he did want to give us an update, though, on what he's been doing in Greater Manchester to drive the agenda forward for our cooperation. So we've got a little video from Andy now. Good afternoon, Congress. I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person with you uh, this year, but as I'm sure you all know, I am 100% committed to cooperation, and I'm very proud recently to have been re-elected for the third time as the Labour and Cooperative Mayor for Greater Manchester. Obviously, we're in a general uh, election campaign, and we have now on the horizon the possibility of a new government uh, committed to cooperation and to delivering a fairer, truly levelled up society. And I hope that cooperatives can play a really big part in this. Before we go into the next session, I just thought I would update you on precisely what we've been doing here in Greater Manchester since the last Congress. Well, one thing we have done in the last year is create a new music co-op. Beyond the Music is a collaboration of major venues, grassroots venues in Manchester combined with international music businesses, trade bodies, artists, managers, promoters, and of course the, the music-loving audience here in our, our city. They've all come together to address and affect change in what is a major export industry for the UK, but one that needs to do more to redistribute funds towards talent development, social mobility, increased diversity, and supporting grassroots infrastructure. And if you are active in this space, you can join the Beyond the Music Co-op and be part of the next event, which takes place in October 2024. Another cooperative innovation from Greater Manchester since we last met is the creation of a new platform called Our Business, which has been set up to develop the not-for-profit inclusive economy across our city region. Our Business is a cooperative and its aim is to build support and help the development of social enterprises, co-ops, a whole range of organisations, those in the community and charity sector. Making sure that the wealth in Greater Manchester that is created is recycled into our local uh, communities. For too long, big businesses in certain sectors have been monopolising things and letting down our residents, making them pay over the odds for the basics and then siphoning the profits out of Greater Manchester. We see that in the water industry, but also in the bus industry here, where we've become the first city region to put buses back under public control. And we've got control of the fare box now, so that when people use our buses, if there's an upside from that and proceeds, well, they get recycled into keeping fares low. But we want our business to take that thinking much broader into the foundational economy, into our communities, helping a whole range of not-for-profit organisations to grow and keep wealth in our communities. At last year's Congress, we spoke a lot about social care and I found it a really inspiring session, particularly listening to those involved with the Equal Care Co-op. And this is something that we're interested in in Greater Manchester and we're still uh, working on and we'll report back on that soon. We've also agreed, as part of my recent mayoral election manifesto, to set up a Greater Manchester Social Care Commission. And I will put the invitation out today to anybody there who wants to be part of this commission to get in touch with us and put forward an application to be part of it. As we move into a new parliament, we really do need to find long-term fixes to social care. And I believe the cooperative movement has a huge role to play in that. More specifically, from a place-based point of view, I was really honoured to be part of the launch recently of Middleton Cooperating, which is a new co-op in North Manchester, led by my friend Callum Nolan, and it's doing great work mapping out who owns Middleton, 
and taking positive steps to tackle the challenges. Another of the big ideas coming out of the recent mayoral manifesto is a huge reform to technical education, the creation of an equal alternative to the university route for young people growing up in Greater Manchester. And this is what we call the Greater Manchester Baccalaureate or the MBAC. The idea is that the same support should be available to young people who want technical or work-related qualifications or apprenticeships. And we're really excited about the work we're beginning to do with Cooperatives UK in this space on a new innovation around accommodation for young people who are taking apprenticeships or degree apprenticeships. So we've commenced a feasibility study sponsored by the Cooperative Bank to look into what we are calling halls of apprentice. And so just to say thanks to all of my friends there in the hall, thanks for all of your support and here's to a cooperative future under a new government. We've been quite busy. Right, okay, so uh, important information. If you're under the age of 30, and that's really important, you may now leave the room and uh, go and work on uh, some plans to bring back to us later. Let's say a huge welcome. Can we have a round of applause for all the young people who made it 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Right, okay, and while we've learned, because well, we've got a bit of a breakout, anyone who wants to come forward, uh, particularly these couple of tables at the front, please, so that our panellists don't feel like they're talking to the uh, back of a room. Uh, so if you can all move forward, those of you that uh, can, um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Thank you. Mid counties leading the way there. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. So. Uh, Sadly, we were unable as well to have Dale Vince with us here today, who's been doing a lot of uh, work on GB Energy, which ultimately will be owned by the people. And we're really hoping uh, with cooperative supply chains, if there is a, a, a new uh, government that's able to do that. Uh, but we will be carrying on uh, with our great friend, again, uh, a, a bit of a stalwart now of uh, Congress. So I'd like to introduce our host for the next panel we have the power our host is john rob if you'd like to come and sit up there and he's joined by michaela cryer director of unity eva murray campaigns officer for the co-op party shaz rahman director of community energy birmingham and dr vicky dunn grinsby community energy can we have a round of applause for our panel Okay, thanks. How's everyone feeling this morning? Yes, not too good then. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're going to talk about power and hopefully you'll get some power from our talking about power. So here's a panel that do lots of kind of very uh, interesting things in the field. But the first thing I've got to do is read this little introduction. So, um, okay, so green industries have been one of the biggest growth areas in the cooperative sector over the past five years. In the UK, almost 500 energy cooperatives of households, community organisations and businesses generate, share and store renewable energy and heat. They are, they are at the forefront of combining small-scale and micro-renewable deployment with other decarbonisation measures and behavioural change. Crucially, these businesses are great at creating local jobs and business opportunities from their activity. And that's kind of the key theme we'll be talking about today as well. You know, 
known as we can create our power, our own power, in our own country with all our horrible wind and rain that we get all the time. And it's a nice idea, but it's actually a good business thing as well. And it's something that the, uh, the people can do. We don't have to wait for the big multinationals to rob us all the time. Um, an increasing number also provides services for the uh, retrofitting of homes and pro uh, premises. Crucially, these businesses are great at creating local jobs and business opportunities from their activity. The local economic benefit from community energy generation is estimated to be 34 times greater than other private and renewable deployment. Well, the number of cooperatives in green industries has grown by 20% in five years. The number of cooperative jobs in the same industries has grown by 80%. In this session, we explore some of these examples of fantastic work already taking place, I see the panel here, where communities have already uh, wrestled power back through ownership of renewables like wind and solar energy generation. But what is the potential of community energy growth? What are the added benefits uh, cooperatives and their members can bring to amplify the positive impacts on climate sustainability? So uh, now we'll switch to the panel. So um, actually, the first thing to do is get the panel to introduce themselves and what they all do and where they're from. So starting at that end. Good morning, everyone. I'm Vicky Dunn. I'm from Grimsby Community Energy up in Lincolnshire on the East Coast. We started in 2016, just the three of us, the founder members of our Community Benefit Society. We quickly got some projects on the go, so we had about 100 kilowatts of solar on five roofs, roll forward with various amounts of funding support, student placements, and a lot of effort from a growing team and a growing number of members. We've gone from three to 100 now, and we've got 530 odd kilowatts across 10 roofs. So we've got bigger with our systems, bigger with the savings we make, and we've also got some funding to look at feasibility for onshore wind, which would be another step change in our growth. So everything you mentioned we're yeah. attempting to do in Grimsby. I mean, what was the starting point for you? I mean, was it just one of these kind of overnight things, I've just got to get on with this, or was it a slow Not process? At all. First pay packet I got, which is maybe about 25 years ago or so now, something come in my inbox, you know how these things do, and it was one of the early community-owned wind farms, and I thought, well, that's cool, and I should probably start saving now I've got some money, so I put some money into that. So right from the early days, I've watched other community energy co-ops and what they were doing, and um, seen it. Then I was working on a business support project, and the other two founder members of GCE were just getting started, and they'd not, it's true, they'd not thought about cooperative approaches at all, but there, the pieces came into place, and I'm like, I know how we do this. I, I've sort of seen it, it all... It all fits. So there in 2016, myself and the elderly posh chap who's on lots of committees and the guy who works for the fishing industry, I'm from Grimsby, I'll mention fish, I will. And, um, and there we were, the three founder members starting to raise money for our first solar installations. I mean, we just talk about this a minute ago. I mean, in some ways it's easier or more difficult to do in a big city where there's more connections than that. I mean, Grimsby, very much out on a limb, what, was there like a community of people that could actually help you get this set up in the first place? Or was it just, person, just your drive? Or was it working in a cooperative kind of structure very advantageous to what you're doing? I think the community structures there are as strong as anywhere in that, you know, people are on committees, they, they do work, they develop projects. But in terms of needing the specific technical support to do what we were doing and learning on the job and going on training days and things. Cooperatives UK with the support to get set up and um, Community Energy England with the support to understand what we're doing in the sector and the training from our peers was absolutely invaluable. So the, the national network in there was really, really important. Okay, Shaz. Hi, yes, uh, my name's Shaz. I'm from Community Energy Birmingham. And Community Energy Bergham started about 15 years ago, just under. And what it did initially was it got a grant from a big energy company to put a solar panel on a community building in Borsal Heath, a suburb of Birmingham, some of you may know. Now, a couple of years after that, uh, we looked at putting a wind turbine up at the Licky Hills, which is right on the edge of the city. And we spent about a year trying to make this work. And we were going to rely on forecasts from the Met to, for the wind speeds but we didn't trust them, so we went and did our own wind speed testing, and it turns out it was half of what the Met 
were reporting. So we abandoned that idea, which was very sad for us, because that was a year of work we wasted. But what we went to from there was we went and uh, did a community share offer for solar power. Um, free, um, we've had three separate community share offers for three different sites. One in Moseley, which is quite near the Borsal Heave installation. One in Ackers, which is a ski centre in East Birmingham. And uh, one at a football stadium in Castlevay, which is North East Birmingham. And all of those were paid for by uh, members of Queen's Energy Bank investing in the project. And then once we in installed the solar panels, we then received uh, the feed-in tariff from the government, which made those projects viable. And we also sold some of the electricity that was used by the local groups at a much lower rate than would be available in the market. For example, those groups are still paying eight pence a kilowatt hour and if you compare that to what you're paying for your own electricity at home, you'll see there's a massive difference. And they're, they're paying that for 25 years, so from their point of view, there's a massive benefit there. So we did those three projects, and then the feeding tariff got cancelled, and we had a massive existential crisis, and we, had a, we sat around being really sad for two years, uh, because we were all volunteers, and none of us are being paid, and community share offers are a lot of work. They were worthwhile, but that model then stopped. So we stopped being sad, and in the last year, uh, we've got some external funding to launch a home energy advice service and that home energy advice service is uh, basically focused on the able to pay market because there's been a lot of work on fuel poverty a lot of work on, on deprivation in energy efficiency but there's been very little um, in the able to pay market there's been two attempts in the last 10 years from the government uh, the green homes grant and the green deal and they both failed miserably so we've got a bit of funding to do some home energy uh, surveys in Birmingham. So if anyone lives in Birmingham and wants a free survey, uh, come and talk to me. <laughs> I mean, where did your interest in this start? Is it, is it something you've always been interested in? So I've been, I was interested in carbs first. So I did some campaigning at university for, for groups like Oxfam. And then when I left university, I got a job for a big energy company called E.ON, uh, which you may have heard of. And, uh, and because I felt bad about working for a big corporation, because I was a bit, a bit of a hippie, I then looked <laughs> for what was around, and I found Burger Friends of the Earth, which is an environmental campaigning group which owns a building, which is 10 minutes away, which we're having a social at afterwards, so we might see a leaflet on there for that. Um, and when I joined Burger Friends of the Earth, I learned what co-ops were, and I learned about the co-op model. And about a year later, somebody I knew from... Uh, from Community Energy Bank reached out to me and said, well, you like cooperatives, you like uh, energy because you work in it. And so then uh, I went and observed a few meetings, learned about the wind turbine plan, and then joined. Uh, so I, had, I already had an interest in energy and I already had an interest in cooperatives and Community Energy Bank was a great way to bring those two together. I mean, what's the advantage of working within a cooperative kind of framework for what you're trying to do? Oh, you have the buy-in from your members because they literally have to pay you a pound and sign up. So the, the key advantage from our point of view is that everybody who invested wanted it to happen. Like they have to make a conscious decision to sign up, otherwise they wouldn't. So from, from our point of view as a cooperative is that uh, democratic control, one member, one vote, means that no one person can invest £50,000 and they get all of the same, which happens in the PLC. So everybody who signs up to a community energy programme accepts that they are have as much power as the other 80 members. Is it, do you think it, this is a realistic future model? Or do you think the, uh, the big PLCs will always dominate the market? Or do you think we're at a very interesting point of history where this could actually flip over? And, you know, the good guys might actually win for once. Yes, yeah, so we'll have to be a bit careful here because I do still work for the big PLC. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's, um, there's an absolutely massive scope for Queen's Energy to grow. I mean, I'm, and there'll be other examples here as well. Um, and we're going to talk about the government later. But even, even what I'm working in at the moment with Community Energy Birmingham, like five years ago, there was very little funding around for community energy projects. And now, even without the government plans, which we'll talk about later, um, we've been able to secure, we've been in a consortium, about half a million pounds like, between like, 10 organisations to deliver a home energy advice service. Those kind of things are coming in, partly because people have a great understanding of what community energy is, and partly because of the energy crisis. So we were re very reliant on imported Russian gas, um, which was very, very cheap until COVID uh, and the crisis of two years ago. So we were, you know, the, the wholesale gas price meant that energy bills about £1,000 in 2019, 
they're nearly double that still, maybe a bit lower than that. And so the focus of energy security, as well as um, how democratic structures can make the energy system better, is now 20 times, 30 times what it was when I started, say, 12 years ago. So working with renewables, working in cooperatives, etc., it's, it's not just practical, it's also good business sense. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, the price of renewables has dramatically dropped. So the price to install a solar panel on your house, say, when Free Energy Beyond started, a four kilowatt hour array may have cost £8,000, £9,000, £10,000. That same array now costs £4,000. Mm -hmm. And if you put a battery on that, which makes it more easier to use, that then may be six or seven thousand pounds, and that's just individual households. If you scale it up to businesses or community energy cooperatives, um, whilst the feed-in tariff model is gone and means that the smaller scale model doesn't work anymore um, commercially, what does work now is just more, so basically more solar panels. So before we, our feed-in tariff installs were four, basically ten kilowatt systems across three sites, so that's thirty kilowatts in total. For that model to work now, without any subsidy, no subsidy whatsoever, uh, if you triple that capacity, you can then do it without any subsidy. So, but that involves finding bigger roofs. So you need bigger community centres or you need small businesses. And so that model, um, which was like searching, searching for the scraps 10 years ago, is now front and centre. Like, um, lots of very mainstream players now want to move into this space because they know it's also good business. Okay, so, so talking of things that don't work properly, you got here just in time because the train didn't work properly this morning, <laughs> did you? Yeah. We can't fix the trains as well. So, yeah, so talk about what you're working on. Yeah, so um, I'm Eva Murray. I'm the campaigns officer at the Cooperative Party. Um, I've been there since um, August last year. Um, and, you know, Co-op Party has had a long-standing priority campaign of, of community energy and, you know, uh, trying to get access to that increase, trying to, you know, share good practice, share the, the blueprints of how it's working across um, the country. Um, and it's been a total, the last year or so, has just been a total learning curve for me, learning more about the different models, um, how, it, how it can work and how we can, uh, you know, better invest in that. Um, and again, a big, huge part of the work I've been doing is, uh, you know, uh, sharing that best practice, giving a, a platform to the many projects that are in the country who are, who are um, excelling just now, a number on the, the panel today. Um, but again, it is around that long-term plan and how we create that long-term plan for, for community energy and tr create that transformative change, not just to the energy sector, which we spoke about just now for too long. We were reliant on, um, you know, uh, you know energy owned abroad and with not with the uh, priorities of the community um, in, in mind so we need to we have to absolutely focus on that but also um, transform the change for, for communities and um, having more say on um, where any profits are spent and what they're spent on and, and the decision making process um, Again, one of the things that I've been doing as a campaigns officer is how we can use um, at, at the cooperative parties, how we can use our supporters, our members and elected members uh, to share that message. How do we get them involved? How do we actually create an effective campaign to, to educate people, which is, I know we'll potentially go on to talk about a bit more, but a big, a big part of, I think, um, community energy is around the education side of it. A lot of people don't really know what we're talking about when we, when we talk about community energy. I think if you don't have uh, you know, community energy project or initiative in your local area or you don't have a, a genuine you know an interest in it out with that um, you, you probably don't see the benefits of it or it's very much a, a, a buzzword so a bit of the work that we do is is trying to take to the outreach work with our uh, members and supporters so we, we have uh, things called co-op lives which a number of people may, may already know about it's often up just now it's not weekly we have weekly um uh, online meetings with experts and elected members or people who are doing good work and we focus a number of times on, on community um, energy. Michaela was actually on one of our most uh, uh, recent ones. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, and I think one of the things as a campaigns officer when I, I got this job was we have to have a, a set of asks or a set of tasks uh, that, that anyone who's just joining can get involved in but also people who want to take the next steps and actually getting involved in, in, in community energy. So it can be from you know writing to your local uh, councillor or, or local MP about why they should be doing more, why this actually matters um, and how, where it's creating change elsewhere um, but also you know, signing petitions or actually directing people to uh, you know, community energy projects that are already, wor are already working and that's the kind of campaign 
Fine side of it, but with another hat on, um, I'm a Glasgow City Councillor, I'm a Labour and Co-op Councillor in, in Glasgow, and um, so I've seen it from the other side uh, with Glasgow Community Energy um, trying to, to battle their way through, um, you know, the the uh, uh, you know the rules and regulations currently in place in a lot of local authorities around the uh, around the country, trying to get priority, not priority, but trying to to, to get the opportunity to to get a project off the ground. Um, Glasgow Community Energy um, had a huge uh, share offer. They got huge buy-in. Uh, during COVID, they continued that work and they managed to put solar panels on two primary schools in the city. Um, and as a city councillor, I've been trying to work with other parties um, and work with other councillors to see how we can expand that work and um, you know uh, make it easier for cooperatives and community energy projects to get more of those opportunities instead of going maybe what might, some might uh, see as the, the safer option. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm like I say, I'm a Labour and Co-op councillor, but also campaigns office at Co-op Party. Um, and yeah, I think it's a really exciting space that we're in just now. Uh, and yeah, I think that the only way is up for community energy, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have more discussion about that. And so, do you think um, one of the key roles, I think what you're saying in there, is, is that lack of information that people don't realise they can actually get involved in this and even run their own power, which you know, power to the yeah. people, literally, isn't I, it? I think, there's yeah. I think there's definitely part of that. I think that if you were to... To, to talk about a, you know, a community energy project or a community energy company, it can be quite daunting for someone to be like, oh, do I, how do I get involved in this? But also, this is a big, this is a big thing to take on. But actually, we, we know and we'll hear from uh, today, there are different, uh, different versions of community energy that, that work for different people. There's different ways people can get involved in. It's not just a case of one, you know, one person. We've already talked about commu uh, you know, a community being there to kind of uh, support that work. But yeah, I think education is a, a huge, huge part of um, it. The work that we need to do, and I think as as a, as a political party, it's something that we've tried to prioritise and, and, and try and get that information out there. We're very lucky in the cooperative party. We have a very um, active members and supporters who want to, to do things and get involved. A number of them are already involved in, in the community energy projects. So that's why I said at the start, a big part of that is showcasing that, showcasing the blueprints and how it can be done, the different models of community energy too. Because um, you know, what, what works in Glasgow might not work in a small town in England or Wales. You know, So it's, it's about, I think it's about us harnessing that and, and showing how it can work. But, uh, education has been, been huge for us um, in trying to get that message out there. You said before at the beginning there's, there's certain models that you didn't know about or were quite interesting. What were those models? I, th I think I think just the different scales of the models. You know, the, the ones that we we've been working with most recently have been uh, kind of solar panel models and things like that. And but, uh, it's just it's different scales of it. Some of our huge huge projects with a lot of buy-in, and then you talk about you know Glasgow Community Energy, which started with just uh, like two projects and, and two primary schools in the city. So I think it's just learning about the different different uh, different scales of of that as well. So, so it's not a one size fits no, all. No, I think that's the. There's a lot of variation of projects people could take on to make things happen. Yeah, and I think, I think yeah. that's what, again one of the eye openers for me was, you know, learn about different um, different <coughs> scales and different uh, versions that people can kind of take on, and the way you can buy in and the different models and all that. Which is nice to reflect on this panel actually. Yeah. Um, brings you brings us to Michaela. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. So so explain what you do. What's your project? Yes, we're, we're a little bit different because we're not a community energy organisation, but we exist to absolutely support the sector. Um, so Unity is a joint venture between Mid Counties Cooperative and Octopus Energy. And what we do is we try and listen to what are the challenges to growth in community energy and how can we help find a solution. So um, prior, the core activity that we do is we work with like Grimsby. Grimsby have got a fabulous rooftop solar project on a YMCA building. So we will buy that energy from... Um, Grimsby, which gives Grimsby then a route to market, gives them kind of financial viability. So through that, we purchase power from over 270 groups up and down the country, um, which equates now to about a third of the sector. So we're really proud of that. Um, but what that means is we get to speak to groups at various stages of their life cycle. So as Eva mentioned, you know, um, we speak to some groups that have maybe done one project on a, a school rooftop versus, you know, the really large groups that have got 30 full-time employees, you know, 20 odd projects, so the, the breadth and depth. Um, again, listening to what are the challenges, finance always comes up. So we launched a construction fund, a part of 1.5 million to help groups. Um, we also offer grant funding because, you know, free money is always a good thing for these groups, absolutely. And then another challenge we listen to, and Shaz really touched upon it, is resource. It's a volunteer-led sector. 
it's 70 percent led by volunteers and the real challenge is groups you know need more resource but time and time again people would say but we don't want to handhold we haven't got time you know i do this in the evening i haven't got time to hold people's hands versus you may speak on a panel like this someone in the room might think oh I love the sound of community energy, how do I get involved? Involved, And it can be really difficult finding groups that are active, looking for resource. So um, we launched Community Energy Connect, um, which aims to do as it says, connect. If a groups need a bit of, I know, help with financial planning or PR, um, they can go and say this is their requirement. And then individuals can go on and say, I've got a few hours spare. And what we're really trying to do is, you know, as Eva mentioned, the profile of community energy really needs to increase. I mean, it's kind of one of the best kept secrets. So I worked in energy for 15 years before I heard about it, which is very frustrating. Um, so we are speaking to professional organisations, engineering firms, lawyers, etc., and saying, actually, you've got all these volunteering hours that you do. Could you put some of that pro bono work into helping community energy organisations? So that's what we're trying to do through the Connect platform. But as well as that, you know, we listen, at, uh, as I say, to the challenges, and they're kind of focused on existing groups, um, you know, finance, resource. Well, actually, to Eva's point about the profile of community energy, we've recently realised, well, actually, it's the concept and vision. If you don't know community energy exists, that is the barrier to entry. So we're looking at, actually, at Birmingham as a bit of a focus of how can we help community energy thrive in an urban setting? So in London, you've got... Community Energy London, an umbrella organisation. Underneath it, there's 30 community energy groups. So obviously, it's a very large city. Not one group can do it all. And with there being so many, um, the social impact is, is tremendous. So some good examples, you've got Celsi in South East London. They're in Greenwich and Lewisham. As well as having 11 rooftop solar arrays, they've also helped 4,000 people with energy efficiency um, and advice exactly what, what Shaz mentioned and then when you look at the city of Birmingham it's got the highest levels of fuel poverty in the country um, I think it's close to like 23 percent so that's so why is that well that's what that's one in four what, why is it so high I think because you know economics the price of um, electricity has gone so high and that's why we're really passionate about the social impact of community energy because yes we need more renewables yes we want them to be community owned but the wonderful thing about community energy is the surplus, any profits can go back to that community. 70% of um, community expenditure from a community benefit fund is spent locally. So if we can help an area like Birmingham really kind of transform and get more community energy projects, then in turn, that social impact on the ground, energy advice, can really help those areas that, that need it most. I mean, what, what's the vision in the future? Is, is it a patchwork? You know, ideal vision of the future. Is it a patchwork of all these sort of independent organisations somehow working with an umbrella? Is it an umbrella kind of organisation? I think umbrellas really, really do help. And then they can streamline the voice, they can speak with government, local authorities. But what we're hoping to do in Birmingham is, for all the reasons, you know, the Shaz mentioned as well, it's that resource issue. So for, we're hoping to actually, as Unity, we want, we're speaking with corporates because we also think... At the moment, with you know councils going bankrupt, you can't really rely on local authorities at the moment because of everything that's going on. So we are, as a unity, we're speaking to corporations in the city of Birmingham and basically saying, have you heard of community energy? This is what, what it is. This is why it's wonderful. Could we install some solar on your rooftop? We do the hard work. We do the installation. We do the feasibility studies. And when it's all ready, we will then sell that on to a newly formed community energy group hopefully kind of raise awareness in the city and then kickstart it um, and hopefully the surrounding conurbations will kind of hear about it and hopefully be inspired to create their own projects. And what's the reaction to that? Do they, do some people go, yeah, brilliant, let's go and do it. And so, to some places, some uh, cities you speak to go, I don't really get what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, well, I think what's been really interesting, and we held a focus group with our community energy partners last year, and one of the themes that kept coming up, actually, was professionalism, because I think some, when you go into a big corporate, if you're a community energy organisation, sometimes it can have the connotation, oh, you know, they're just in the community centre, they don't, you know, kind of volunteer-led, mm, actually, would it be safer going with, you know, a private developer? Whereas I think we've probably had the luxury of being you know, part of Octopus Energy, being part of mid-counties, 
and then be able to say, look, we can speak of what the sector's doing. There's over 500 organisations. Um, you know, they spend over a million pound a year in community benefit fund. It's real. It's happening. We can share the examples of the big groups like Bath and West, Bristol, of what can be done. So then it's we'll be going with that angle and then help them say, well, this is what it could look like. And if you're a company that's interested in uh, not just co and this isn't just cooperatives, it's you know PLCs. If you've got strong CSR credentials and you, you care, it's kind of what's not like what's not to like. But they just haven't heard of it, and that's mm. what we're trying to do. So at the moment, there's, there's an information gap, really. This is you know between what you're trying to do and what they understand of what you're trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, in the middle of Community Energy Fortnight, we're actually going to be in the centre of Birmingham just for a whole day session, just doing like lunch and learns for professionals in the city with the end game is just to raise awareness. That's it. And I think what's also really helping us is being part of mid-counties um, and showcasing that these sorts of bodies can install rooftop installations. So um, run by the inspiring Pete Westall, um, he's done a project with Big Sailor Co-op across mid-counties for 27 rooftops um, to have installation by a community energy group rather than just going to a private developer to do 27 projects so for us to go and say to these organizations look this is happening this is real this is a great example again i think gives them the confidence of oh why not let's do it again i mean literally empowering people yeah. to actually uh, take uh, their lives into their own hands yes. you know not not wait for somebody else to go and do it but you can actually do it yourself yes can't you? absolutely yeah, which is such a powerful message so the challenges to this i mean this is quite an interesting period now isn't it because it looks like Labour will probably win the election, hopefully. And um, so for you, that's all the people here, that's it's got, potentially is going to make some differences, going to, potentially going to make some changes. But what kind of things would you like to see change and what sort of challenges do you have at the moment which make what you're doing more difficult than it should be? I think our big challenge at the moment, and shares and other community energy groups may have a different perspective, our big challenge is raising the money um, for our current share offer so <clears throat> we've always done okay we've always delivered on our share offers but inevitably as you keep sort of trying to do more and more you'll you'll hit against something with a bump and if there were more ways to get large blocks of investment there so that we can say look dear people of Grimsby and surrounds if you invest in this we can also access this 50 hundred thousand of matched investment from some fund which we have benefited from Cooperatives Finance and from Co-ops UK and from some other funds. If we could have those bigger blocks of investment, then we can continue growing. So from our perspective, sort of being in the middle of our fifth community share offer, that's what we would like. Um, also, grid connections. I hear from other organisations that um, it takes ages to get grid connections, it, which we have experienced, but also they may be told well, you can connect, but you'll need to pay us a six-figure sum for some, more you're not in, for some more infrastructure to make that connection, and that kills the project. And that is a real barrier to more installation of more renewable energy. So sorting out the local grid connections would be an important issue. And not least because um, the other issue, onshore wind, we hope it can come back because, as we were saying outside, it is the cheapest of the renewables and easier to deploy than offshore. Although I would say offshore wind's great because, again, I'm from Grimsby. So a lot um, of people don't know that you can't actually build new windmills on land at the moment, can That you? has been the case yeah. through the present period, yes. Which, um, which is pretty ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. well, well, we would want to because it's another step change in our growth. It's a step change in... Um, the size of everything we can do, the community benefit fund, and that I guess would be the same for many other organisations, and that barrier removed. So three barriers, funding, grid connections, wind. Yeah, so I mean, that's interesting to say that because I think it's not, I mean, financial is the main thing, isn't it? That's the obstacle to everybody getting anything done, but it's not the only thing, is it? So it's, there are practical changes that need to be made, hopefully in the next few months or whatever, like to change actually the infrastructure and the way things are done as well. I can't comment on that too much because we've not had problems with the planning system um, or grid connections so much, but yes, I know other groups have, so I think they would ask for that. Mm -hmm. 
And she asked, what, what would you like to see getting changed? You know, well, uh, just a quick point on the, the grid connection issue. So the reason why they want you to pay six figures six, um, is basically because they don't want to invest the money themselves. They know the grid needs upgrading anyway, irrespective of what you're doing. But if they can get somebody else to pay for it, that's what they're always going to try. But in, uh, I'm going to focus on something else. So it's a relationship building. So, for example, we live in Birmingham, um, biggest local authority in Europe. For 12 years, we've been trying to get a relationship with the local authority, Birmingham City Council. We've had one meeting with them in 12 years on Zoom, and that they, and the uh, cabinet member nodded along very nicely, said, "Oh, that's an interesting idea," and we never got any further that relationship. We tried, we tried many different ways through different regimes of the council, and got nowhere. And so, why is that? Is that because um, they don't really understand the concept, or? Or it's just so vast, it just switches them off? Or so I, 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 can't, I can only obviously uh, speculate because I'm not part of the council, but it's partly, um, the, and this is through various workings of the council, is that they've got a way they've been working for a long time and they're scared of trying new ideas because there's a risk there and it can go wrong, and if it goes wrong, then there's lots of, count, lots of knock-on effects it can have. And um, also, the council is just very, very underfunded. Um, from 2010 to now, uh, it's about, I think, 60% of their funding in real terms of what they would have had 14 years ago is what they have now. And so the staff numbers are maybe a third in some places in the council. And so even if you do find somebody who's quite keen on the idea and you can talk to them, because we, we can talk to people individually, but we can't talk to the gatekeepers, shall we say, um, they go, well, that's a really good idea, but I'm actually working on 17 other things, trying to save my job. And so I like your idea, but we can't do anything with it. And so one of the, the key things from us, uh, and I'm sure the others will agree, is that when we have the change of government, we had Jonathan Reynolds on his screen yesterday saying that he's basically going to be a co-op business secretary and the current government is neutral to co-ops but doesn't really care about them in a pro or negative sense. They kind of know they exist but won't promote them, whereas a Labour government, a Labour cooperative government, uh, hopefully will see the value of the sector and... Uh, pump a lot more resources. We had Richard Parker here yesterday, who's the, the new mayor for the Westminster Combined Authority, talking about creative co-ops, and so he understands the value of co-ops, and so the biggest thing from our point of view is that those relationships will be there with people who actually want to work with us rather than having to work against other people to try and get one voice in amongst a hundred voices. Is it, when you speak to, say, like the council, it's not purely financial, is it? You just look... Or is it financial? You just want their financial back, and or do you want space to actually do stuff as well? I, um, so yeah. part of it is financial, but part of it is that um, because their biggest uh, employer, for example, in the city, is that they have so much leverage, and they can introduce it to suppliers, they can open a door with local businesses. So that um, whilst uh, the money would be helpful, um, it will be just as helpful, for example, for them to say allocate an officer for half a day a week to work with us together. So, um, and Michaela touched on it early, uh, really well as early as that. It's, it's the resource part of it. So the finance is obviously a key component, but we do have a group of very skilled volunteers who, are, who have the knowledge and the understanding of how to do it, but we massively lack the resource. And so even if we could get a half a day a week with a council officer and we could identify sites together that the council could put so on their own roofs, that would make life a lot easier. And we sort of do it through the big seller cop in a different entity. But if we could do it through um, the local ca council who own hundreds if not thousands of buildings, and uh, maybe half of them could be suitable for solar. And mm -hmm. so we think, obviously very biased, that we could be helping the council do the stuff that they should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's the most frustrating part is that there are loads of council buildings around that could have solar and don't. And obviously we couldn't be the only partner to help deliver that. We, we could part of 10 organisations who do slightly different things to help the council put loads of solar on their buildings. So you hope, you're thinking, hopefully, with a potential change of government, this could actually change? Uh, on a local basis, I mean, more through the West Midlands Combined Authority. Uh, so the West Midlands Combined Authority has a remit all across the West Midlands. And so whilst the council still has the funding concerns, still has the bankruptcy, the Section 114 to deal with, if we can get a relationship with the West Midlands Combined Authority, um, they... They don't, they're not the overlapping in terms of they don't have authority of the council per se, but they do have their own strategy, and that strategy with Richard Parker, the new Labour mayor, hopefully will, will involve a lot more community energy than it currently does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so uh, with the co-op party, etc., I mean, these are challenges that people are facing. I mean, 
do you, can you actually help answer those challenges or what challenges do you find as well working in your space? Yeah, and I think the relationship building um, point is, is, is just really important because when, you know, when we got this kind of briefing out and there was going to be a question around this, my mind kind of went to my hope for any future Labour and Cooperative government would be for that space to listen to the sector and actually understand what the priorities are because I think we understand or we know that this isn't going to be an overnight fix and I think there's expectation management in that. I don't think we would want it to be an overnight fix because that would show to me that it could all be undone overnight um, too. Um, but as a start, I, I would hope that any future, um, any change of government would you know, be a government who at least understands and appreciates uh, uh, you know, locally produced and community owned um, energy. And you, you said you met, we, we heard from Johnny Reynolds yesterday on the screen. Yeah, Jim McMahon here at Angel Fortune. Um, you know, two out, two out of three of them are cooperators who will hopefully be a part of that um, future government who are putting cooperative values into practice every day and you know, trying to push for those ideas. Um, I think you know, for the last few months, the Cooperative Party have been working with the Labour Party to try and get some of these commitments into the manifesto. Um, Last, last week we saw that um, kind of launched, uh, you know, the, the, the plans or a bit more plan for the local power plan, uh, GB Energy, I know a million new owners, uh, three billion uh, invested into the sector in the next parliament. Um, I think, I can't remember the figure off the top of the head, but there's, uh, I think it's like 300 million that's actually dedicated to community energy, um, you know, and actually partnering with local companies and cooperatives. Um, and also the, the overarching kind of commitment from, from the, the, the recent manifesto on double the co-op sector We've, we have for you know over a decade now a government who has not respected cooperatives who doesn't really have any interest in it. any kind of money that is set aside for those kind of projects has been ad hoc or time limited and just kind of forgotten about for a headline I genuinely believe that this change of government that we will hopefully see in, in less than a month's time will have like I say cooper cooperators at the heart of it who will continue to push for these but I think the challenges for that and the challenges for us as a cooperative party is the expectation management. We know that there's a lot of work to do. We know the priorities for us as, as a co-op movement and one of them is absolutely uh, community energy and building access to that or getting ensuring there's more access to that, more owners across the country um, and how GB Energy links into that. But it's expectation management because like I say, this is a long-term project and I would want it to be a long-term project because um, if it wasn't, um, I think it would show that we're not taking this seriously enough. So, Michael, you, you touched on some of these problems before and the challenges, yes. but I mean, what kind of solutions would you like to see if, if they be getting in all the next few years? Yes, well, at the moment there is actually a consultation for a call to evidence for the end of June for groups to put forward what their barriers are. But I think how, how we see it is with the, the local power plan hopefully coming into play, A, that money coming in will really help the existing groups. And, and there's some really big groups that have amazing projects like Ripple, Bristol, mm. Bath and West that will really help raise the profile. So I think that's going to, to really help. Um, and then secondly, the other challenge of resources, yes, it is a challenge, but I've never seen people so kind of interested in community energy. Where's their energy from? Yes, we need more renewables. And yes, we want to be empowered. And, you know, eco-anxiety is on the rise. And the beauty of community energy means you can get involved, you can take action, and you can make things really happen in your area. So I guess it's more of a... A call to action really you know we've, we've heard some wonderful examples and it's you know in your community you can do this yourselves mm. and through our platform community energy connect and um, recently a few weeks ago a fabulous person joined called sarah she's got loads of legal experience she wanted to join a group um, in north london in barnet there wasn't a group there so she's now found some other people we've helped her create a brand new group and yes it's not going to happen overnight but you, you can do this mm. right now and you can form your own group or, or join. So I think just join the movement and it's, it's only going to grow. I, see, I really like that message, you know, the idea you talk about eco-anxiety yeah. and also because after the Russian gas thing, you know, people start to panic about yes. energy. People didn't really think about energy before. No, it's like water. Totally you just agree. press a switch, turn the tap on, it's there. Now people realise it isn't actually there yes. and the people are actually ripping you off from all these bigger companies. And um, what do you do about it? You can actually do it yourself. Exactly. Or join other people and do it together in a cooperative kind of sense, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that's powerful, isn't it? That's, that's literally is empowering, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So because uh, we, we started late, we've only got time for a couple of uh, questions from the floor. So has anybody got a question? Um, Sean, somebody, you have to get a mic, or can you shout, Sean? I'm sure you can, I've heard you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the mic's coming now. Oh. Yeah, it's just coming. Yeah. Uh, 
Sean Fenson from uh, Cooperative Network Infrastructure. Um, that was uh, fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I've just uh, w this isn't really a question, although I'd be really interested to know what the panel thinks. Um, but uh, as well as the supply side of energy, I think there is a tremendous role for cooperatives on the demand side, uh, and in particular, uh, for example, uh, heat networks. Uh, there is a role, I think, for uh, cooperatives in the organisation of heat networks. And one of the things that uh, we're very interested in in cooperative network infrastructure, we have a, a stake in uh, um, various data centres which produce large amounts of excess heat uh, which can then be fed into, uh, into local communities. Uh, it's an expensive process, but it, 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 it's a very... Um, a financially sensible process uh, and we think that there's a role for cooperatives in distributing that heat. And then secondly, um, we're talking about the, um, the, the grid connection problem. Um, if you take a place like Blackpool, for example, there's a huge amount of offshore uh, wind energy there and insufficient capacity to get it into the grid. Uh, and so data centres, which we're going to need more and more of, uh, which the Labour Manifesto talks about um, uh, increasing the number of data centres that's very much driven by AI and so on, uh, they are a tremendous sink for, for energy. So as well as thinking about how we generate energy, I think there is a, uh, um, a, a, an interesting question around how we use that energy, and again, uh, there's a, a role for the cooperative model there in mediating the, the transactions between the energy providers uh, and the energy sinks. So I throw that in and interested in any. I mean, uh, gr growing up in Blackpool, I know about the, the wind power coming off the sea. Yeah. <laughs> so co-op, you basically co-ops working with co-ops in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone want to pick up on yeah. that? I could do yeah. the district heating one. So yeah, there's an absolutely amazing opportunity for district heating. Yeah. So if you have a new housing estate, for example, if you put a big ground source heat pump at the start, at right at the start of the project, and you have that owned by everybody who moves in, that is an absolutely amazing way of keeping that infrastructure renewable and local. And also, if you have existing networks, it's much harder, and it will take much more investment but the, uh, the opportunity for district heating networks that could be cooperative is there. We do have these uh, district heating networks in Birmingham in the city centre, but they're like massive projects and they will be hard to have cooperative power structures. But if you're doing a, a road, for example, absolutely amazing opportunities there. If you can get the whole road on board, you can, you can replicate that up and down the country. Okay, I think uh, we really are nearly running out of time. There's just one thing I want somebody to pick up on. Is that these are these great ideas, they're beautiful ideas, aren't they? But actually, what's interesting about this, it makes business sense, doesn't it? So if somebody just wants to pick up on the idea that we're not talking about airy, fairy, nice, hippie ideas, which I love, which are great, but this is actually something that's, well, I suppose you could put this one on, couldn't you? Yeah. This is a business model. Absolutely. So I think if, if we take a school, for example, that's a perfect example. The school hasn't got much cash. Community Energy Group, they can take on the capex, they can install the solar, um, they take on all the costs, the operation and maintenance. The school will then pay a fee for the electricity generated. So they're still decarbonised, they're still getting cheaper electricity than if they imported from the grid. But crucially, they're not having to put the capital outlay. The Community Energy Group are, and then the Community Energy Group are also getting a profit. So from that perspective, it's, it's an absolute win-win. You still get cheaper electricity, you're still decarbonising, but no capital outlay. It's a win-win, so that's a nice place to end on. So thanks to the panel. Yeah. Thank you.